So now we understood the infrastructure. Now we do essentially the thing you would do if you would learn uh, JavaScript. Yeah? That you say, okay, there, there's now the Node.js server, and now on top of the Node.js server, you want to run your program, so therefore you have to learn JavaScript. And the good news is Ethereum is inspired by JavaScript. Yeah? It's, it's a totally different implementation. You cannot one-to-one -one use JavaScript knowledge, but it's very similar from the syntax-wise. Uh, but on the other hand, as we discussed, it's a, a strongly typed programming language, so therefore it's more like Java in the sense that all variables at compile time have an inferred type uh, or defined type, uh, and you get a runtime, not only um, you get uh, compile time uh, type check checking errors, you can also delay some type checking. Uh, if you do casting to runtime, then you can also get casting errors at runtime, but that's very similar to Java. So now we want to learn a little bit uh, the language, uh, like learning JavaScript. Uh, and we do this, uh, let's say, by a mixture of, uh, let's say, language reference. Yeah, since you know a lot of other languages, we simply say what's different from other languages you know, uh, what are the, the, the driving forces, why is it different? Um, and also uh, we show some examples, yeah, because often it's like hello world, yeah, uh, once you know why, what public static void means <laughs> already, then you learned a lot about, about Java. Yeah? And that's also a typical problem you have, that in order to write something sensible, you have to know a lot of concepts, yeah, because all these things are then classes, and you have to understand inheritance, etc., and static things. So therefore, we first go through these concepts, and then we talk about more or less the uh, way of uh, working with these con language concepts. Okay, as I said uh, last week, uh, Solidity is a high-level language to write smart contracts for Ethereum. The formal definition of Ethereum is a uh, Ethereum Java, uh, Ethereum virtual machine, EVM. Uh, so therefore, you, one could imagine also changing and having different high-level languages uh, compiling into uh, uh, EVM. Uh, and the idea is it should be tailored to the idea of uh, uh, writing collaborative interactions via contracts. <clears throat> so therefore, it's based on the idea of encapsulated units, uh, like abstract data types, we would call it in computer science, or classes with uh, local state and uh, instances of these classes, which are called objects. So therefore, it's an object-oriented paradigm, and the idea is that, you, um, that contracts communicate by message passing, uh, invoking methods of other contracts, and the uh, other object then decides which implementation of the message should be used. So therefore, you also have inheritance and overriding of functions and late data, late binding. And what's the big difference to other programming languages is uh, it's called a persistent programming language. So therefore, if you define a variable in a Java program uh, and the Java program stops or terminates uh, or the process ends, uh, then this variable is gone. Yeah, the value of the variable is gone. Um, in Ethereum, it's similar like in an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, if you define something in an Excel spreadsheet, you save your Excel spreadsheet, or if you have a transaction which runs on a contract, then the contract stores its state in a persistent in the blockchain. Yeah, so therefore, the next time you invoke the contract, um, even after your process ended, the contract still has its persistent state. Uh, um, again, these functions uh, have. Uh, so the methods which are attached to these elements are called functions, uh, and you not can only have functions which are declared as parts of objects, but you can also have higher order functions, so that you define uh, anonymous functions which you pass to other objects, uh, so therefore it's also a functional uh, uh, style of programming possible. Uh, we talked about uh, compilation to bytecode. Yeah, if you compile Solidity, you do type checking, bytecode is generated, um, and this bytecode is then deployed. Uh, what is very important that since uh, not only the data is immutable, but also the contracts themselves are immutable, so therefore if you once created a contract and now you have 500 users, or one user or, uh, or a user community using this contract, you cannot retract the contract and replace the contract by a new version. Yeah, so therefore, it's not that you can update existing contracts. Yeah, so you can deploy new contracts, but if uh, other uh, people have links or pointers to the old contract, uh, you, they, you cannot replace the old contract yeah, because they are immutable and persistent. This means you cannot patch existing contracts, uh, even if you know they are buggy and everybody would like to patch them. So therefore, you have to have certain patterns 
to allow the exchange of contracts um, uh, if everybody agrees uh, and move from one contract to another contract. Um, also, if there's a programming bug, um, also the code is visible. Uh, the, the EVM code is visible, yeah, the, uh, JV, um, the, the byte code is visible, but you can re-engineer the byte code to find out what's happening, and therefore uh, you can also, um, everybody can see your code, and if you have a bug in the code, let's say a security, maybe you don't check correctly for the access control, then people could find this out by looking at the code and then maliciously exploit these bugs in your code. Um, on the other hand, uh, this is good that is open source in this sense, because that's a, a typical pattern, what everybody says, which is the safest way of uh, developing safe software, secure software. It's not security by obfuscation, that nobody knows what's going on, but security by having open source, having many people looking at the code and making sure that the code is correct. Yeah? So therefore, after initial glitches, which happened in the past, um, people are much more aware how to do safe, secure Ethereum programming. Yeah? Um, and therefore, there are a lot of also tools which help, help you uh, to, to find e uh, uh, repeating glitches in, in programming. Okay, so, um, so that's in typically you have to learn two things, and I think uh, Uli maybe already showed this to you. Let's say, how do you go from the code in the text file, which is a um, Solidity file, um, to EVM code, then to send the transaction to the network, yeah, which is deployment to the execution environment, and then the bytecode is put into a block and mined, and the contract can be used now. Yeah? So these are now more steps which are happening here, because here also you have to deploy the code on the blockchain. Yeah? Uh, it's not only that the data is persistent, but also the code is, the bytecode is persistent, um, and therefore also it's important that it's not too lengthy and uh, you know all these things. Uh, again, you could write a huge uh, contract, yeah? but typically you use modular programming that you don't put hundreds of classes in one file, but you typically put one um, a contract or one class into one file. And if you have very complex systems with a lot of contracts, uh, then you would have separate files in a, in, in a, a project uh, file. Um, okay, I think this should be okay. Yeah, and again, the deployment itself is a special transaction. Yeah, so that the deployment of um, contract is something which is more or less provided by the uh, um, Solidity virtual machine. Yeah, some built-in construct, which is pre-existing. Okay, and again, this also means if you do this in production, you have to pay money to deploy the code, even if it's not executed. Yeah, you not only have to deploy, uh, pay money for executing the contract, but also for deploying the contract, you have to pay more or less the fee which is necessary to um, mine this block. Um, I think we start now not with Hello World, yeah, because as you know, uh, 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 um, Blockchain-based systems uh, don't interact with the environment. You need to have uh, oracles. Um, so therefore, uh, what we do now that we uh, define uh, a small contract, which uh, should more or less um, uh, define more or less um, uh, to do the following. It's a sample program. Uh, it should more or less provide uh, one constructor. Uh, which defines who created this contract. In uh, this case, this should be the professor that creates uh, the contract. Uh, then I want to ask uh, a given BBSE object, what's your professor who created you? Yeah, this would return uh, the professor, which created more or less the message, uh, which created the contract, sorry, which created the contract. And then we want to have an additional function, function which adds tutor um, uh, with a first name and a last name and a tutor. Um, uh, object uh, to uh, the um, to the state of this contract. Yeah, so so blockchain-based system engineering is run by a certain professor. The professor is determined by the person which caused the contract, and then um, the uh, professor uh, can should add uh, a new tutor. Okay, um, so that's okay, again what we want to achieve. So therefore, if you look now more closely at the code. You will see that many things look very similar. Let's say if you would replace this by class, 
um, maybe the sucked keyword you don't have in Java or JavaScript, uh, if, if you would make this as a local variable uh, or as a type declaration, uh, then you would see a type, tutor as a type, which has two um, fields, a first name and last name. Um, then you have a, a data structure, which is now the um, variable tutors, and it's a mapping from address to tutor. Uh, that's more as a, a key value table, which is a built-in data type, uh, like you find in some programming languages, that you have ta hash tables or something, where you can map some object type, like addresses, to some other object type, in this case, uh, tutor objects, uh, and then you declare a variable of this type, uh, and then you have a local variable which is called professor, which holds the address of uh, the contract, of the wallet, of the person that called this, um, this created the blockchain-based system engineering object. Uh, what we then have, which is new, which you didn't see in other programming language, is a modifier, and modifiers are extra code which you can add to other functions as preconditions uh, pre or postconditions. Uh, you expa can expand existing code by, by additional uh, code which should be executed before the body of the uh, function is executed, mm -hmm. or you can add code which should be added after the body of the function is executed. In our case, it's mainly used for access control purposes. So therefore, the idea is we want to have now a modifier which we can add later onto other functions and say, if I have a function and I add to the function the, uh, the suffix only professor, then I want to make sure that this function can only be called by a professor, by the professor of this lecture. Yeah. So therefore, this is the idea. I have a pattern um, or a mix in or a modifier, it's called in Solidity, which I can add to existing functions. Yeah, for example, I want to require that the person which calls this function, the message sender, is the professor which has been defined here. Yeah, that's more or less an authorization check, yeah, that the, uh, this is a precondition, and therefore it is written as a requirement, require statement, something like assert in Java, uh, that you well, just test this predicate. If it's not true, the function crashes uh, and raises an exception and the transaction is aborted. If it's successful, then you have this keyword, which is more an underscore, that now the body uh, is uh, executed. Yeah, so this stands for the body. For example, if we apply only professor uh, to, uh, to the, this function, the body are these three statements. Yeah, so therefore, the underscore is replaced by these three statements. Uh, okay, and uh, if we now uh, get the professor, um, we wouldn't check. Everybody can ask who's the professor, therefore we don't add this OD professor modifier to get professor. Um, okay, I think this should suffice. I will go more into more details, but this gives you the idea, let's say, what a typical contract looks like. It looks like a class. You can instantiate the class by having a constructor. Then you get objects, uh, and then the objects have a local state, in this case these two variables, and they have a set of functions, in this case, or methods, uh, the getProfessor method and the addTutor method. And then as an added feature of uh, Solidity, you can add modifiers to all of these functions, um, which restrict are typically used for access control, um, to, uh, uh, to make sure that only certain parties uh, can call these functions. Important, I think, is the fact that this is persistent data. So therefore, this mapping table of the um, um, addresses to tutors is persistent, and also the, uh, the link to the professor or to the wallet of the professor is also persistent. OK, I think we talked about this. Um, um, OK. so. Here, maybe we can also talk about these function modifiers. Um, so we had now a lot of modifiers in Solidity because um, I think this has been learned from JavaScript um, and Java uh, that you want to more or less make, have a lot of control who can use parts of your contracts, more or less. So therefore, you can essentially uh, define these keywords internal, external, public, and private which more or less control the visibility and the access uh, to these functions. Yeah? And we talk about this later, yeah? but, but you know public and private, uh, and if you don't have a modifier, here you also have internal and external as a modifier for uh, controlling which other classes or contracts can call this function. Uh, then you also have uh, further modifiers which are called pure, 
and you know pure functions from uh, from functional programming, pure functions are functions which don't have any side effect, yeah, which don't modify the blockchain. And that has a lot of importance for blockchain-based systems engineering, because if you have functions which don't modify the blockchain, they are much cheaper, and you can also can also be safe that this fun pure function only calls other pure functions. Uh, so that therefore, the purity of a function is not only of academic interest, like in functional programming, uh, that's a pure functional language, and it's something like clean and uh, nice, but pure also means it's cheap, yeah, because more or less it doesn't need uh, uh, modifications of a blockchain. Then you have a constant modifier that the function cannot be overwritten. Uh, you have U functions, uh, which only provide read-only access uh, to data, and you have payable functions. And the idea of payable functions is that a function not only can execute something, but a function can also um, initiate a money transfer. And since this is very important that you know this is the function maybe moves money around uh, from your wallet, um, uh, then you want to know that this is payable function. Yeah? And that should be part of uh, things which are also are checked by the type checker. Uh, so that if, if you do some paying transaction, that it only happens in payable functions. Okay, uh, what's also important is that um, a um, function not only returns one type, but it returns a, a, a tuple of results. Therefore, a function not only returns one value, but it can return a, a, a list, not a list, a record of values which are uh, identified by position. So therefore, you have multiple return types here uh, in a function definition. Okay, um, so now assuming that you know JavaScript and Java, I think uh, we now can rather have a very compact definition yeah, that you more or less know what is different or, uh, from JavaScript and Java. And therefore, this is the way we are following now. Um, um, yeah, I think we already mentioned the general characteristics. So therefore, if I want to explain somebody a programming language, the best way is to say, what are the objects and things you can manipulate? So we often start with the data model. Also, in a If you talk about a software architecture, we often start with the data model. Yeah, what's the expressive power of the data model? So therefore, we talk about a language, and a sub-language is a language which allows me to define data types. Yeah, and therefore, you always start now with the built-in data types that you say, okay, there are some built-in data types which you expect from any decent programming language, like integers, unsigned integers, and booleans. And again, you would ask me, what's the size of these? How many bits are they? We talk about this later. Then you have um, structure data types, uh, which allow you to combine these objects into larger data types, which would be array uh, a constructor, which is a type constructor, which takes another type and creates an array of this type. We have structures, uh, which are similar to records in, uh, let's say, other programming languages or structs in C. Uh, then you have enumeration types where you can create new base types by enumerating their values. And we also saw an example of a mapping, which is a key value uh, data structure, which takes keys of a certain limited set of types and produces a mapping to objects of, um, um, of another type. Uh, and these objects of the other type could either be integer units, arrays, booleans, arrays, or again mappings. Yeah? So therefore, you have a type complete programming language because you can arbitrarily nest these uh, data types. That's called type completeness. Um, okay, um, so as well as the built-in data types, which describe the potential shapes of things that you can construct. Um, and obviously, you're also creating objects yeah? uh, if you have classes. Yeah? This is more or less than user-defined types. Uh, you also have built-in uh, first-level objects. So these are, um, uh, how would you call it, uh, literals yeah, you can produce. Uh, and these literals are either that you can write, denote specific addresses. Yeah, if you maybe look at a blockchain uh, which is existing and you want to point to some objects in this blockchain, you could type in the address of this object in the, in the blockchain. Yeah, it would be something like hard coding uh, 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 a file name of an Excel spreadsheet you want to point to. Yeah, so therefore, it's, it's possible, but it's rather unusual that you create literal addresses. Yeah, that's one way that you can create more or less values of type address uh, without using a constructor. What you also have, you have uh, built-in 
objects which exist, something like this, for example. Yeah? Another program which we have the object this, which refers to the current uh, object, uh, the receiver of a message. Uh, here you have additional objects in uh, a blockchain-based system because you now uh, would have a, a transaction object, which is a transaction that has been initi initiated uh, to execute now the contract. Uh, there's a transaction object, uh, and then you have a message object, which talks about the message you have received. Yes, yeah, so who is the sender of the message? Yeah, please, uh, we call the get professor method. Then you want to know what is the argument of the get professor message method. Uh, you also want to know who sent the get professor message. So that's the message object. It's a predefined variable which has a predefined semantics, yeah, which is a first level object, uh, which are in scope more or less in uh, every program. And then you have the variable which is called block, and the block allows you to also access the current block um, that um, uh, will be mined. Again, you will get much more information about this, but it's more as an overview yeah, that you say it's, it's not so much what is come, coming new and we only focus on the red new things. Again, since we have a transactional-based system, like a database management system, where you want to execute uh, transactions atomic and roll, that, roll them back, um, uh, you have uh, built-in functions like uh, uh, start of transaction and commit transaction. Uh, and abort transaction. Yeah? So therefore, you have operations like assertion uh, to require something, uh, yeah, which asserts something, which, which is uh, you require something, and you have the ability to roll back a transaction. Yeah? So these are these built-in functions which are predefined uh, and mapped to, to instructions of the virtual machine. We also have, uh, which is a little bit unusual, built in uh, cryptographic operators, uh, which are not implemented uh, with a lot of bytecode instructions uh, that would be too expensive. Uh, therefore, the, you have built in opcodes, which are efficiently executable and where we can be sure that they do what they promise to do, yeah? uh, which are now all these uh, um, uh, built in algorithms. Uh, uh, and again, if you need more information, go to the documentation to see let's say, which uh, signature algorithms, uh, et cetera, these are. What we also have, we talked about this concept about, about gas. Uh, we have a gas left operation function, which allows uh, us to inquire the current gas level, which is the left for the execution. And we also have a block hash uh, operator to get the current block hash. And we also mentioned last week uh, the idea that if you create a contract, um, there's also the way to uh, relinquish and release the con uh, this, all the data structures of this contract. Imagine you have a contract with millions of tutors, and then if you destruct now this contract with millions of tutor, tutor objects, you get you get money back that you now uh, release this uh, ma uh, memory which is needed in uh, by all the miners. Yeah, that's the self-destruct operation that a contract can uh, destroy itself. Um, okay, and then you also have certain literals. You know this in programming language, like true and false, or uh, 0, 100, mm -hmm. 1.5 million uh, or exponential notation. Uh, but you also have here uh, the notion of units for ether. Now, if you have calculations in values which are ether, then you have now the uh, ability to write down five ether in a programming language. Uh, as usual, you have uh, control statements, uh, uh, an if statement, else statement, do, while, break, continue, for, return. You have this ternary operator for uh, performing a conditional evaluation of two expressions, uh, of one expression with two results, uh, as usual in other programming languages. Okay, now we want to go a little bit more deeper uh, into these things I mentioned already. In the big perspective, we go down now in the pyramid to the next level, uh, that we look now at these um, uh, visibility rules. And visibility applies to functions, who is allowed to see and call this function, but it also applies to variables, yeah? uh, because you sometimes want to have public variables that people can directly access the state of your object Sometimes you want to encapsulate these variables uh, and only allow, let's say, uh, subclasses to access a variable or uh, only the local uh, contract. Yeah, that's more as this idea of this visibility declaration. Uh, and here we are, they are essentially ordered by, uh, let's say, restrictiveness. Yeah? Um, 
So external methods are methods which can be called by other contracts and via transactions issued by a certain wallet. Yeah? So they are, in this sense, external, that if you look at a blockchain-based system, that anybody from the outside world, which is, which is not a contract, uh, any person or anybody else with a wallet can now uh, call these uh, uh, transactions. Um, uh, or can call these functions, sorry. Or, or can access these functions, uh, can access these uh, attributes. So therefore, uh, uh, external is the most visible or permissive way. Uh, and also the most dangerous, yeah, because uh, it's now accessible to everybody and everybody can call it. Um, okay. Um, and it's important that since they are external, um, they are always publicly visible. Yeah, so the external implies public, but it also adds a new restriction because external means they can only be called externally. Yeah? So therefore, other contracts cannot call external ones. Yeah? So therefore, you want to say external functions or methods are those where you enter the network, yeah, which are more or less top-level functions, and they should stay top-level, so therefore declare them external. But for example, if you want to define a reusable library, external would be not a good choice because you want to have other contracts to call it. So therefore, uh, things other contracts should call, you make them public. So they can be called externally, but also internally. Uh, and if you have state variables, which are defined as public, uh, then they will by have, by <coughs> they have getter and setter, so getter and setter methods, which are created automatically by the compiler. Uh, so therefore, the idea is that you now want to encapsulate, you have a public state, but you want to be make sure that later on, if people call this pub get method, if people want to access this state, then you can override the getter and setter methods to do some additional, let's say, sanity checks or uh, do some calculations. Yeah, that's the idea that public methods now have additionally getter and setter methods. Um, if you have internal uh, methods or internal uh, variables, um, they can only be accessed by the contract itself or by any contract derived from it in the sense of inheritance, yeah? that you now can declare, I have a contract and now I want to create a subcontract or a derived contract based on this contract. Uh, so as the name implies, we are not callable from other contracts and they are not callable by other transactions. Uh, and then if you say uh, this is too dangerous that maybe subclasses do an overriding of something, uh, then you can declare something as a method as private. Um, and then it's called internally because only your contract, which you have written yourself and you have compiled, uh, can call uh, your private method. Yeah, so if other people then create derivatives of your contract, they can call it. Um, so when we talk about the function types, um, uh, so you first have the default one, yeah, that you don't speci specify anything, you should be derive a function. But now if you want to convey more information to the type checker or the compiler and more information to your users, you can declare a function to be a view function. Yeah, um, so therefore, uh, these are read-only functions, so they do not, do, do, do not modify any state variable nor alter the state of the blockchain. Yeah? They can read other state variables. Yeah? So that's the idea. For example, um, if you have a state variable state equal 5, which is an integer, an unsigned integer, you could define a function which, has, uh, which is not pure in the sense because it gets an integer a, uh, or an unsigned integer a, and unsigned integer b. It's declared as a fu new function, and it returns uh, um, a a, a, a sum, which is an in integer. Yeah, that's more or less the signature of the function. And now we have the function body. And it's not really a function uh, uh, because it's not only taking the two arguments and adds them up, but it also adds a global variable to it, the values of state. Yeah, but since it's, so therefore it's not pure, uh, but it only reads states. Yeah? So therefore, this, there's no update operation, there's no side effect. Yeah? I can I'll call arbitrary many times the add function. It will always yield the same result um, because, um, yeah, oh no, it's not, no, sorry, that's wrong. I can, I can call the add function. It may yield different results yeah, because it depends on a public state, which might have changed because that has not been declared as constant. Yeah? Uh, so view functions have, have the property that they don't do state changes. They don't have 
create side effects, but they may depend on side effects. Uh, if you want to say that we are even uh, uh, better programmers, uh, that we have functions which behave like mathematical functions, then we would declare them as pure functions. So we would declare the uh, compiler to say the function add should be a pure function because whenever I call something a plus b, it should always yield the same result. And this is indicated by the pure annotation. And pure means that a pure function can um, uh, can uh, not modify the state, but it can also not uh, depend on public state. Yeah? So therefore, this would be a legal pure function because it only depends on uh, arguments here uh, or on constant values. So these are these two things. Uh, finally, there's a word which we don't use as an annotation, but which makes sense to talk about special function types. It's called a so-called fallback function. Um, so the idea is, um, and it might be a good or a bad idea, yeah. Uh, the idea is, uh, it is something you also find in other programming languages. If you send a JavaScript object a message, which the object doesn't understand, uh, there could, could be two, two answers how to solve this. Uh, if I send an object uh, a message, which the object doesn't understand, um, uh, the system should fail, yeah, because it was undefined. Another line of thought, there's no, if I send an object a message it doesn't understand, maybe the object can handle this message in a sensible way. Uh, and therefore, the idea is that it, uh, that, and that was the decision of Solidity Design to say a fallback function <coughs> is a function uh, which uh, is unnamed. Yeah, so therefore, the function looks like this. It's a function without any arguments. And this is called then the fallback function. Uh, and the idea is the function uh, fallback function is called when no other function matches the function call. For example, if either is sent without any function call to a contract, yeah, uh, which would be a sensible thing that you say, actually, I don't want to compute anything. I simply want to send this contract money yeah, because the, the contract should have money. Uh, and therefore, this is the idea. Now, if I want to do this, this function would be called. So that the contract, whenever the contract receives money, could do something sensible to catch it. Uh, the important point is, uh, since this is a side effect thing, it's, it couldn't be. If it's not a pure function. It's not a view function. Uh, so therefore, it doesn't take any arguments. And it doesn't uh, return anything. Yeah? So therefore, this is more the, feed, feed, the fallback function. Uh, obviously, you can imagine. If you have a programming error, uh, et cetera, or you by accident call a function, the wrong function, uh, then the fallback function would be called. Uh, so therefore, this is potentially a security risk. Uh, so therefore, the fallback function uh, is, uh, let's say, something you should think about. And I don't know whether it makes sense, for example, to have an implementation of the fallback function, uh, which somehow uh, doesn't undo or whatever, if you don't expect that this should happen. But I don't know whether that would be good practice or bad practice. Um, OK, and finally, we have these payable functions. Um, because uh, as I said, uh, if you look, uh, as we explained it the last uh, week, if you execute a program on the blockchain, the program does two things. It performs computations, and it performs value transfer together. Yeah? And this makes it a smart contract, yeah? because if you give something, if you do something, you get inf you provide information, you get money uh, in exchange. Or if you do computation, you get money in exchange. So therefore, you also now want to uh, weave in uh, payment uh, functions uh, into your code. And these functions, which have a side effect not only of changing global variables, but even moving money between accounts, they have to be indicated as payable functions. Yeah, so therefore, if you would try to do this, let's say you have a function which is called plus, and uh, in between, you simply uh, deduct money from your caller. Uh, that would be a bad idea. So therefore, you have to declare it as payable so that everybody sees, OK, by the way, uh, this will move money around. Um, so therefore, I, th I think uh, the idea is now that you, if, if you want to have a function which in the body does, or in a transitive call uh, initiated by the body, does a payment operation, then you have to uh, indicate it as payable. Um, and that would be, for example, I want to buy something into an ICO. So therefore, I want to transfer money to this IC initial coin offering. And in exchange, I want to maybe get um, some um, 
uh, rights uh, or be listed as an owner here. Um, okay, um, so I think this was for this part, uh, a deep dive into these modifiers. Um, we now have also additional, in, in, the, in the function, what's it called modifier, it's uh, function types. Uh, function modifiers um, are sometimes called mix-ins um, or um, uh, mix, I think mix-ins in other languages. So the idea is now um, you want to more or less uh, define, as I said, a piece of code which should be executed before executing a function. Uh, and also sometimes you want to define code which should be executed after execution of a function. Yeah? In order to do this, um, um, uh, and this code mo mo uh, very often does things like uh, sanity checking. Yeah, that certain arguments are there so that uh, um, a certain state exists of your object, uh, or that the caller of your function has certain properties. Yeah, um, and that's I think the most frequently used uh, pattern in Solidity for modifiers that you uh, attach access control code uh, to your uh, contracts, yeah, that you say uh, maybe this is a contract which can be only called by this user group, or this contract can, or, or this function can only be called by the owner uh, of uh, the contract, um, or by certain individuals which are named, yeah, by the system administrator uh, or member of a certain group. Yeah, you could also have ideas like uh, depending on the state of your object, you could modify this, yeah, so that. Uh, maybe there's a phase in the life cycle of an object where you, uh, yeah, let's say, if you create uh, an insurance, you negotiate an insurance, uh, uh, the system has a certain state and certain people can negotiate, but once it has been negotiated, locked, then you have other access control that later on only an execution is possible and other functions can no longer be called. Yeah, so therefore, uh, the idea is, I think, rather smart to allow now uh, these pieces of code, which we would then add, attach to multiple of these uh, methods, that you factor them out from the individual functions and you give them a, um, a good name. Yeah? For example, here uh, you could have uh, something, um, a contract which is called owned, it's ownable. Uh, so the idea is now that you have an owner of the contract, uh, that's a typical pattern you will find, that you have an uh, owned contract which is owned by some party which has privileges for that uh, uh, for the owner, then you would typically have an own, a modifier which is called only owner, which says that the person which is calling this contract should be, um, or the party which is calling this um, contract should be equal to the owner, and the owner is defined as uh, the sender of the message which created the constructor. Yeah, so therefore, the constructor doesn't get an explicit argument, but we use this predefined object message like this to say we refer now to the, uh, the message which called this constructor and this message object contains a sender attribute and this sender attribute is now the caller of this constructor. And by definition, the caller of the constructor automatically becomes the owner. If you want to do this differently, you could also uh, have a parameter here, which more or less defines somebody else as the owner. So therefore you could define it here and then say owner equals uh, O, if this is the argument. But later on, we now talk about the modifier, you would then always have this repetitive question. Uh, if I have a function, for example, to kill a contract, to self-destruct the contract, you want to say this should only be done by the owner. Only owner should kill um, the contract. Uh, so therefore, the kill operation not immediately executes self-destruct owner, but first executes the statement require message or saying equals owner. If this is false, um, or if this predicate is false, uh, the function um, is aborted, um, the call of the function is aborted and leads to a transaction abort. Okay, are there any questions? Uli? Sorry. Okay. Questions? Any questions? Ah, okay. So you you you. Are, so, and what kind of questions uh, do do you answer? Uh, 
so for example, one question arised, um, as you mentioned that a class can basically extend another class, are there any prototype classes for specific use cases, e.g. IPOs that are commonly used? Maybe you can give an example yeah, for you. <laughs> so I think uh, the most important thing is, um, so I've not been very experienced uh, contract programmer, but I think uh, also from classical software engineering, it's very dangerous. So if you so if you have uh, prototype classes or inheritance, uh, it leads to a very high coupling between the uh, person defining the prototype and you. Uh, and a lot of control is also in the part of the owner. So therefore, in blockchain-based systems, to my understanding, uh, you can correct me, uh, it, you typically don't do a lot of inheritance, yeah? because uh, the, if, if you inherit, either you inherit from your own code, then it's easier for you and more secure also for you to see what's going on, um, uh, because you don't want to extend the system later on uh, to, to use other program met, uh, patterns like composition instead of inheritance. Uh, it's, and it's even more so if you would inherit from some prototype contract which is out there in the wild, because if you cannot really be sure what's the implementation. Yeah? So therefore, to my understanding, inheritance of prototype classes with abstract methods is not the thing you would do. Um, so therefore, uh, uh, yeah, that's not the thing I would recommend. And also IPOs, et cetera, are done in a different way. So um, to, maybe, to maybe extend a little bit on that answer, um, so there are some interfaces defined, or if you look, for example, at uh, all these ERC standards, and we will cover, for example, the ERC20 uh, contract uh, later on, these are all not um, definitions in terms of what is the functionality, but more in terms of what is the interface. So um, to establish the compatibility between exchanges, software, wallet software, uh, systems, this is what happens a lot in terms of you define the interface, you define what the idea is behind this, uh, this the, the functions that are exposed. But apart from that, the, the implementation is up on yourself or you rely on some standardized um, implementations. For example, Open Zeppelin is a library which provides a lot of, um, a lot of solidity, yeah, so to say, um, examples there, uh, which implements these standards. So that's, that's definitely there. Or maybe the professor answer again. <laughs> uh, so there is the one thing which is important this is the concept of subtyping and genericity, yeah, that you have interfaces and subclasses can implement the same interface. Yeah, that's more or less polymorphism. I think this is supported and that makes perfect sense because you have one protocol like an ERC20 token, which can be uh, implemented and uh, also extended. Yeah, that's uh, the, the interface, it's polymorphism with the interfaces. Uh, and that's heavily used uh, because it defines standard ways of interaction and it allows extensibility of the system and usability. But then you have also reuse of code, yeah, uh, which is inher inheritance, uh, that you have pieces of code which you want to plug in and reuse in a certain way, template methods, etc. And that's not that uh, uh, relevant in the current blockchain-based world um, uh, because more or less it would it, it, it increases a little bit the risk if you do cross-party sharing of code and yeah? uh, makes it difficult to trace and what's happening at runtime uh, because if people then again create subclasses of these cl your classes, you, you have a problem. Yeah? yeah, that's true. So therefore, it's polymorphism and inheritance and code reuse. These are two different things. And you do code reuse as uh, only correctly explained by um, using modules and libraries uh, and co composition and not inheritance. Oh, yeah, that's, that's okay. true. Inheritance is something that is in, in, integrated in Solidity, but it's not really used, in my knowledge. Let's check other mm -hmm. questions. Oh. Um, ah, yeah. mm -hmm. Wouldn't uh, the fact that the address of the owner in the example in the slides make it writable and therefore create a vulnerability if someone calls the setter method? The fact that it is public, so um, I need. To, I think you um, go back to so slides. Here? I think it's a little bit. Uh, um, yeah, I think previous slides would have this example. Let's check. Yeah, I would think so. So this um, this address public owner is a public um, function, so it's a public um, 
variable. So there is a getter method automatically created, but there is no setter method automatically generated. So in this case, if you would have a setter method in terms of, okay, um, um, set set owner, this would obviously have to be protected by the only owner modifier. But for example, this constructor, um, which sets the owner to the msg.sender can be only executed once. So there is no, there is no security hole in there. So that's, that's for, um, that's for sure. Are you sure? Really? Isn't it? I could imagine, maybe I went wrong, but again, I'm not the experienced mm. programmer. By definition, I think we said, that, so if I define this like this, there should be a getter and a setter method. So therefore, after calling the constructor, since this is not uh, constrained, wouldn't it be possible that somebody else simply uh, updates uh, the uh, the owner so, with, a, with a set owner? So if there is a set owner function, then it's true, yeah. But there is no, so so to my knowledge, and um, I programmed I think uh, last week Solidity. Um, if you just define okay. a um, just define the public uh, variable, there is no autom automatic um, get them. Uh, there is. Ah, okay. okay. That, that okay. I have, so the that's idea is it's not. Um, 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 sorry, that seems to be <laughs> that seems to be wrong in the slides. I'm very sorry about that. I have to. No, no, no. So, so we don't have. So I think the idea is here. So the question is now. Uh, Maybe we are now confused, which is good. Yeah, that confusion always helps to clarify something. So we neither have the keyword public here, nor the keyword external, private, whatever. So therefore the question is, what does it mean if nothing is written here? Yeah, and obviously if nothing is written here, it seems to be the case uh, that it's then default, it's, I don't know whether it's private, it's not public. So I would imagine if, if you don't write anything, it's not, I oh, know here it's public. Oh, sorry, I'm stupid, I'm not reading that correctly. If this is public, this is wrong. Yeah, because if it's public, it should have a setter method. Um, and so therefore, I would expect that this would be indeed possible to change this. But maybe we should now run an experiment where, while I'm lecturing, um, whether this is possible or not. I'm, I'm just uh, typing it as you, <laughs> as you talk. Um... OK. Big fun for everybody. So let's check it here. So we have this. Yeah, I think there's no good reason to make it public. I think that's a bad idea. <laughs> but again, as usual, I didn't see it. Yeah, continue, and I will. I will. Um, I don't know what. Okay, so I will continue. So Oli, Oli is sweating, and I am uh, waiting for the result. Uh, okay. So while Uli is checking this, we can continue more or less that function modifiers can obviously be com combined, yeah, because they are talking about different things. Um, and the modifiers will be resolved sequentially starting from left to right. Yeah? So if you have multiple modifiers, uh, yeah, the question is how do you compose them? Uh, and they are um, uh, reserved uh, from left to right. Yeah? So that's, uh, for example, here we had something uh, owned, um, again, with this questionable public field. Maybe if we remove it right now, uh, then we are on the safe side. Um, so we would initiate it with the sender. We have uh, the old, only owner modifier as before. And uh, we have also the additional constraint uh, that a person should be rich. Uh, so therefore the message sender balance should be larger than 100, this amount of ether. Yeah, so that's a very artificial thing for uh, educational purposes. And now if we say uh, function kill, that we say only the owner, which is rich, should do this. Yeah, that's for, from left to right. Yeah, only owner is left, uh, is rich, is right. So therefore the I idea is that you first execute message sender equals owner, and, uh, and then you check the balance of the message sender. Yeah? And that would be then uh, the semantics of the self described operation. Okay. Um, yo. Oops. Then we continue. Uh, now we come into this field of um, overloading. Yeah, you know we have um, um, overwriting methods, uh, and here we are talking about overloading methods. And the idea of overloading is that you have one method, for example, send ether, which has either this signature, uh, one argument of integer type, or it has two arguments, 
or it has one argument of one type and another argument of another type. That's called function overloading because the same name of the function is used with two different parameter types. And this is nice uh, if you do this because it allows you to write code which is more readable, yeah? that you don't have to say something send either and send either to. Uh, but it says, okay, essentially it should send either. And now by uh, depending on the arguments you're sending, uh, it does slightly different things or uses a default value for something. Yeah, uh, so therefore this is allowed, uh, like in Java, in JavaScript, that you send, uh, well, function overlay makes, makes mostly sense in statically compiled programming languages, because the decision whether you call this or that is done by the compiler, not at runtime. Um, so therefore the send ether uh, should send ether to a, of a certain amount from your account. So therefore the uh, here the condition would be the current balance uh, of uh, the, the current contract is larger than the given amount. And then we uh, invoke the message transfer operation to transfer this amount to a receiver. Uh, this was one argument. Uh, if you want to, uh, so it, and we transfer it to the message sender. Yeah? So the destination address is the message sender. Uh, if you want to uh, now define where the money should be transferred to, uh, the beneficiary to, should be somebody else potentially than the message sender, then we would add the address as a second argument, which is option, optional in this sense. Uh, it has the same precondition, but uh, then it does a transfer operation and not the this transfer operation, that it transfers the amount to the target uh, address. Okay. I think that should be clear, and this is not tied to the sending of money. This works for all operations like uh, addition with two arguments, addition with three arguments, subtraction, are you know it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the answer is Uri has the answer now. Yeah. So um, I just tried it in Solidity. So um, it. Um, I even could share my screen here. Let me uh, do that right now here. But also for me, please. <laughs> yeah, I did it for you. Do you see it, Florian? Uh, no, I have to open it now. Can I press it here? Only, well, yeah, it's now should see it. Yeah. Yeah, public professor, yeah. Yeah, and if you look here, that's the, that's the source code here right now. And um, we have our address public professor. And um, let's deploy it. So this is our smart contract. We can deploy it right now and uh, see this uh, BBSE here. And because of this public statement, uh, we get a um, uh, this function here and it returns um, my address right here. So if you look here to AE, that's the owner, the owner of professor here right now. And um, yeah, so it does not cons it does not create automatically a um a setter method and if we remove this here uh, then he will likely um, complain and uh, in terms of that i should declare i ah, yeah, no, that's a rather, so if we uh, remove that one to create a new contract here um, then it's a uh, not set to public so this is uh, if I remove this public keyword, I think it uh, it remains private or internal. So, so the public here. The public automatically generates a getter function, but it does but not not a setter function. So we have to correct more or less the slide. Yeah. yeah, that we say it does. It only generates a getter function, but no setter function, which yeah, is okay. That's true. Okay, which is safe. Yeah, <laughs> because okay. Then we have to change the slide. Uh, there's something wrong uh, that we would have to write here. Uh, we'll have a, a getter function, no? Mm, yes. Uh, can you um, share your slides again because of your screen? Because um, when I, I kicked you out, so to say, of ah, okay. screen sharing. Ah, so, okay, I have to share it again. Um, so we go back to the slides. Uh, too many contexts. Yeah. Ah, oh, sorry. I, I have to fix that. Sorry. For yeah, that. so therefore we now, I think, uh, thank you for the question. So the current hypothesis is we get, uh, by experiment, we found out we get a, a default getter function. 
but it doesn't have a setter function. Yeah, and I could imagine that you can, obviously you can write a setter function yourself, um, uh, but then it would be very obvious for you that somebody else can, can, can write it. But again, we will check this, double check this, and uh, then in case this was wrong, um, so this should be removed. Ah. So, uh, kick out Uli. So now we could continue. But again, I think this was very instructive for you and a very good question. Yeah, because these kind of small program errors, you know, in, in many of your programs, you do this wrong, yeah, that you are very lax with public and private, etc. because it's you writing your code and running it uh, and not other people taking your code base and modifying it. And if you deploy contracts publicly, this is essentially what everybody would look for. Is there some way, uh, in particular in this uh, uh, access control code, which uh, where, where I can cheat? Yeah? And so therefore, that was a very smart remark uh, because this is the mindset of people. Yeah, it's out there in the wild, the code is visible, and it is handling money, so therefore the incentive is high to uh, hack uh, these systems. Okay, so we talked about the chaining of modifiers, we talked about function overloading. Then there's another feature I think you also know from other programming languages which are uh, younger. So the idea is if it's not only positional arguments uh, that you say the first argument and the second argument, that, but that you can say um, um, that you have, no, sorry. So you have, sorry, the, the definition is as it is, yeah, you have uh, parameters and they have names, obviously. Uh, and now we can uh, call them either as usual, that you say you call my add function with four and two. So therefore the first parameter goes to A and the second uh, actual parameter goes to formal argument two. Or you can also switch it uh, by saying, I want to call the my add function, and then you use this notation of a record-like uh, structure that you now pass it uh, the arguments in arbitrary, in an order, which is in, um, in arbitrary order, but by defining keywords. Yeah? So if you say B should be two, A should be four, and then the compiler will check that these types match. And therefore, if you write the code, you don't have to know the order of the arguments, but you can simply write down the names of the arguments, which also makes, makes the code uh, in many cases more readable, uh, because uh, if you have five arguments, the question is always, uh, what does two mean, what does four mean? And if it now has a keyword in front of it, uh, it's sometimes more easy, easy to read. Um, Okay, uh, and again, technically this is done by having a dictionary, yeah, like uh, what you see in these mappings, uh, and these mappings uh, which have uh, keys and uh, um, which are now the keys here, and they have to match, and then you would do the, the necessary uh, mapping uh, also based on overloading, which may happen here. Yeah. Okay, now we come to inheritance. I think we already had some question about it. Um, and uh, I also discussed it when we created the slides two years ago with Uli, um, uh, how, how much inheritance is being used. Uh, so Solidity supports inheritance of contracts, um, uh, but technically this is done uh, because it's a blockchain-based systems, it's done differently from the typical technical implementation you would get in, uh, in, in let's say Java or Java virtual machine because inheritance means that you write the code once and you use it multiple times. Uh, here Solidity implements it but it, it copies the code from the parent contract to the subcontract and creates a single piece of bytecode which is deployed to the blockchain. Yeah, so therefore um, even if you think you would save code by using a shared superclasses and then inherit the code instead of copying it, um, this would not happen because Solidity would expand the superclass code, the bytecode to the subclasses, yeah? and creates independently deployed contracts. Uh, on the other hand, Solidity is uh, um, more liberal than Java because it allows multiple inheritance like C++ or C Sharp. Um, so therefore the idea is that you can have multiple parent classes from which you inherit. And then you get again one big contract which inherits all these uh, features and parts and pieces from the parents. Um, okay, so therefore we then come to this concept of overloading, yeah, um, and um, that you now have multiple implementations, and therefore you want to have now uh, the possibility to call superclasses. 
Yeah, so therefore, then you have this method uh, of calling superclasses, um, and these would be typical things um, uh, you know from other programming languages. Um, there are uses for this in authentication and safe math, uh, which more or less uh, you can inherit from. Um, but I think it's not really the main programming pattern. If we talk about multiple inheritance, there's some um, very typical problem. It's called the diamond import problem. Diamond, you know, uh, so this is more or less a diamond here, a uh, router of Deutsch or uh, this shape, um, where more or less you have one superclass. So the, the message was if F inherits from D and E, uh, the code more or less is, uh, uh, inherited. And if you call super, there should be a certain order. Let's say, imagine you have a method here and a method here, which is called Peter, and you now call Peter here. It should be clear which Peter you want to call. Um, and in order to explain this, uh, you have to understand maybe D Peter is not defined here, but it's defined here or it's defined here. Yeah. So therefore, um, if you are here uh, uh, and, and you have this diamond, then you have two ways of going to B. Yeah, so therefore, there's this one that B, uh, the D inherits from B, and therefore F inherits from B from D, uh, and also E inherits from E, and E inherits from B. Yeah, so therefore, you now have to resolve what's happening here uh, if you have such an import uh, inheritance tree. Uh, and again, it's uh, similar to C sharp and Python. Um, so you have a super class linearization algorithm to define the order of inherited functions. Yeah? So the idea is um, there is not imp an implicit order for parent classes, but the order is defined by the developer. Yeah? So therefore, if you write this piece of code, you write import D and then import E. Yeah? So therefore, the order in which you import becomes important in these boundary cases. Uh, that more or less uh, the order here is important. Yeah? So therefore, also the order in which D imported A and B becomes important. Yeah? So that's more or less the typical uh, uh, picture you will get uh, if you write down and expand your in inheritance uh, uh, statements. So if Y inherits from X, uh, you would, would write this, F inherits from D, and followed by inheritance of whatever uh, you get from E. Uh, so therefore, uh, in order to achieve this graph, uh, we would have the following declarations in different contracts. Yeah, let's let's look at it. Um, we, we start maybe with F, where we say F inherits from D and E. Yeah, this was what we have seen here. F inherits from D and E, and the order is important. It first inherits from D, then from E. Similarly, E inherits from B and C, first from B and then from C. If you go back, it was D, no, it was E. It was E, E first inherits from B and then from C. Um, so, uh, and then you now have this algorithm here, the C3 superclass linearization algorithm, which um, would more or less now uh, define a linear order, which says, okay, um, if you now expand all these statements here, you would get uh, for F, uh, the resolution order F, D, uh, as D, E, A, B, C. Yeah, so therefore, the, the position of A of B, which might be dubious, yeah, where is now B? Is it twice or is it here or is it there? Is resolved now in, in, in the way as I have described it from left to right. So therefore, F, D, A, B, C is defined. And therefore, if you now call super in F, which is the main question, what happens now if I, I'm now in the class F and I call a super function, which class uh, is now responsible? Yeah, where do I look? For, for the result, the, uh, um, the method. And that's done by this function resolution order that if I call, let's say, something like the method plus, then I would first call is plus defined in F, then I would call, no, if I call super, then I would look start looking in D. Is there the plus operation defined in D? If not, I look in E. Uh, if not, I look in A. If it's not in A, then maybe it's in B. Uh, or it's in C. Yeah? And if it's in none of them, the compiler would complain and say, I cannot resolve a function. Uh, and that's more or less what's happening. Okay, I think this should be clear. Uh, and if not, I think you can, can walk uh, slowly to, through the example. Um, okay. Um, okay, maybe you can now do an exercise here. Uh, 
So we, we now um, do the same thing. We have contract A, which has a get amb operation, which returns 1337. We have a contract B, which inherits from A and uh, returns uh, super.getDumber plus one. We have a contract C, where, uh, which inherits from A, which has a function getNumber, which calls super get number plus two. And now uh, we have a final co a contract, final, uh, which is more or less the final contract we're defining, which inherits both from C and B, has a get number function, uh, which returns super.getNumber. Yeah? And now that would be now the puzzle. Uh, and again, you can try it out on your computer. Um, uh, or you do it in your head with the function resolution order. Yeah. So if you want to understand this, maybe you have a picture here. No, we don't have a picture here. Um, maybe I don't try to draw it on the screen now. Or maybe I can do it. So we have now the class final. Uh, maybe you can write it here. We have the class final at the bottom. And then we have the class, so it's final. And then we have the class uh, C, which is here. Ah, oh, shit. We have D. Ah, and um, and we have class A. Yeah, I've been now, uh, if you now add lines to it, we said, okay, F did this. Idea. And now if you look at B, then both C and A imported from A. So it's now a diagram. Yeah, it's now again a diamond here. F um, or final F, uh, and therefore we get now this uh, resolution order that we say F imports first C, then C imports B and A. Yeah, so C imports A, uh, and um, B imports um, also A. So therefore, the, the order is final C, B, A. So therefore, the, the, uh, the call would be that uh, C in uh, super would point to B. Yeah? So, that's, um, so therefore, the super call uh, leads to, to this. Yeah? So therefore, the final result is 137 plus 1 plus 2 equals 134. Yeah? And this is more or less, again, very, at first glance, unintuitive, yeah? because only yeah, so if you look at B here, it's uh, it, it, it um, so so B more or less locally looks as, as it would depend on A, but since it's now in, introduced in a new uh, larger context where you have this function resolution order, uh, you get these surprising results. Yeah, so therefore it's very important, uh, and this is a reason why multiple inheritance is also something again where people argue whether it's a good software engineering tool at all. Yeah, because once you have this diamond import problems, uh, uh, very strange things can happen, which are not as obvious if you look at each of these statements itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then we come to this idea of abstract contracts, which are something like a hybrid between interfaces and implementations. Uh, I think some of you also mentioned this as template contracts or um, um, yeah, yeah, where you have what is boilerplate code in the in the um, parent class, and you want to inherit the boilerplate code from the superclasses, but the superclass itself is not um, cannot run on its own, then you would define something as an abstract contract. Yeah. So um, as soon as a contract has an abstract function, it's called an abstract uh, contract. Yeah. Um, uh, for example, here uh, you have a pay monthly fee method which returns a boolean result. But in, you don't have a method implementation here. Uh, it simply defines a signature. Uh, there is something. So the car insurance promises that it's a, uh, it has a monthly fee, uh, but it doesn't say how the monthly fee is really calculated. 
So therefore, this is an abstract function. And if you have an abstract function, the contract itself is abstract. Yeah? Um, so therefore, if you now try, you can compile this. Uh, and that's okay, but you cannot deploy it. Yeah? So therefore, the idea is uh, this is bought as a protocol. And the protocol uh, then has to be uh, implemented before you can deploy it. Okay. Um, so therefore, we uh, now would define an interface. So an interface is now something where you say, I don't intend to have a subclass which uh, implements it, but I simply want to define a protocol, like a protocol how to handle tokens or a protocol how people can communicate. Uh, but I don't want to say, uh, I want to give them a lot of freedom how they implement this contract. Yeah? Then I would define an interface. Then I would say, this is a car insurance interface. It defines a protocol that car insurance has to uh, consist in the key feature that you have to pay a monthly fee uh, and the monthly fee returns a Boolean result. So therefore, uh, um, so therefore it's, it's, it's very restricted like in Java that you cannot define constructors yeah, because that doesn't make sense. It's a protocol. You don't define variables. You don't define structs. You don't define enums in an interface. You simply define abstract functions. Uh, um, there are also a restriction that uh, interfaces can in inherit from other interfaces, but they cannot inherit from a contract or they cannot implement another interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, and again, uh, I think uh, my, in, implementing multiple interfaces is also very useful yeah, because that typically happens if you have an object, maybe that implements uh, um, two features more or less at once. Therefore, you would inherit from two, or you would implement multiple interfaces, let's say management interface and a, a provider interface and a consumer interface. Yeah, so that would, would, makes perfectly sense. Uh, it is also good practice also in Ethereum to define um, that you have contracts which implement multiple interfaces. Okay, I think that was a lot of concepts here and more or less as usual if you talk about concepts talking about the boundary conditions, so it looks very complicated. Um, so now we move on to go to, let's say, what could call it something like programming styles, programming patterns and programming guidelines. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As Uli mentioned, that there are several questions regarding inheritance. I think it now looks very complicated. Yeah, but once you have this picture in mind and you understood this function resolution order, I think you can uh, really reconstruct this result. Yeah? I think on first reading, because if I now repeat it again, some people would be annoyed that I spent too much time explaining it once again. Um, so therefore, I would recommend that those people who still have questions regarding uh, why is this happening, read it again carefully with paper and pencil, uh, construct this order, and then you will also find out that now uh, where, what is this, the, because that's the total order for all of these classes. That's, I think, the important point that the compiler now, once all the classes are there, creates this long thing um, to make sure uh, what is happening. Yeah? So therefore, you really have to understand uh, and take, take away as a le learning from the lecture. Uh, uh, only if you know all the classes and all their subclasses, then it makes sense that you can, can really find out what, for example, this super operation does. Yeah? Because it's not really that you say, because I wrote A here, something's happening. Uh, because now uh, interesting things can happen if you have other classes which now also imported the A. Yeah? And that's, I think, very important that you take this away uh, also for a learning independent of Solidity. Whenever you have multiple inheritance, ask the developers and consult the manual what happens if you have this diamond import. Yeah? What will be the, how will these calls uh, of B, C, and F and the super calls be resolved? Yeah? Uh, and again, uh, and if you don't find enough information in the slides or on the internet, then ask Uli uh, in the exercise. But again, it's really a boundary case. Um, and as usual, boundary cases are things where people, in particular in Ethereum, could exploit it. Yeah, you define something and then somebody creates a new subclass and embeds it in a larger contract and then some things happen you didn't foresee. 
So therefore, I mentioned this, yeah, that if you have a very expressive language with multiple inheritance, that might be not detrimental for the safety and understandability of your contracts. Okay, I think we still have left only three minutes. Uh, therefore, I maybe would uh, not continue here. Only mentioned this. Maybe ask answer another question. So, if you have questions about other parts, um, just write them and tweet back. I think that's the best way to use the last three minutes here. Um, Uh, yeah, so maybe we maybe we elaborate a little bit on the this keyword. So on slide 16. Okay. Um, we use a keyword called uh, this, and we did not introduce this in the slides. I checked that. And maybe we okay. can talk a little bit about, so it, it might be obvious, but um, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, actually, uh, so this has the same semantics as in Java. Uh, and maybe those of you which are experienced JavaScript programmer know this is danger, danger, danger if you have nested, uh, nested uh, function definitions. Uh, so the idea is uh, this uh, is in Ethereum the same thing because it's also a statically compiled language. This refers to the receiver of the message. Yeah. So therefore, uh, in particular, for example, if you have superclasses, uh, yeah, so if we, instead of writing super, get number, we would write this point get number, uh, we would more or less uh, take the current receiver of the message is the object this. Yeah, so if more or less, uh, if I later on call a function and I write this dot get name or this dot uh, uh, get, pro get owner or whatever, uh, this is the current object which received the message. Uh, and if the code has been written in a superclass, um, this would be an object which has much more attributes, for example, and more features than the object in the higher class. Yeah? So therefore, this is the same semantics like in JavaScript. Uh, in Java, that this refers to the receiver object um, and is resolved um, statically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and it also allows the access to some variables in terms of this dot balance is actually the amount of ether this contract currently has. So that's uh, the idea for that. And I think one was last question here. Um, uh, and I like that one. I think it's a more uh, high level question. In practice, it is possible for contracts. Um, in practice, is it possible for contracts with, with written in solidity to be perfectly secure? Correct. I don't know of a software that hasn't had any bugs. What if there was a systematic bug? How is this situation handled? So generally, what's your take on the security of <laughs> yeah. smart contracts and what can we do about that? Yeah, I think as usual, I think all of us are realistic people that we say uh, any software of, of significant complexity has bugs. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a truth Yeah, because um, it, it requires a lot of efforts to, to eliminate bugs. And there are two approaches. Historically, there was this idea of mathematical proofs, that you do proofs of the correctness, which works nicely if you have uh, hashing algorithms, whatever, and that the implementation is correct, uh, and you do this. Um, and you do this in, 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 in a theoretical computer science. In practice, you build systems, and people add to these systems, and people do uh, cut and paste errors. So therefore, the best way of eliminating bugs is to test the system, to have people pay people to find bugs, uh, yeah, uh, and the nice part in uh, blockchain-based systems is you pay people for, <laughs> there is incentive for people to hacking the code. Uh, yeah, also in the past, there had been bugs not only in the code, uh, and there are dramatic uh, errors in the past, but also there are bugs uh, in the compiler, yeah, which so therefore also there, there exist bugs in the compilers and the tools. Um, and this is inevitable. And therefore, the main question is, let's say, um, and you know this, if you look at a house, you build a house, uh, there are these, it's in Germany, it's called Kinderkrankheiten, children's diseases. These are things which are at the beginning of a lifespan of a piece of code. Uh, that there are bugs and you find them at the beginning and the, then uh, the most obvious bugs 
more or less eliminated. But the more longer the system exists, there you then also reach the boundary cases, and then there are maybe more, more bugs. So therefore, the main idea how here is now that you try to reuse or copy and paste code which uh, has run for a long time, and that you also try to minimize the complexity of the things you do on chain. Yeah, that's I think that's the general idea in blockchain-based systems that you really say what are the essential parts, uh, the money, the rights, um, uh, what are the core features we want to do on the uh, on the chain, uh, which are have these uh, that I can be sure that I cannot revert them, and what are parts maybe I do off off chain. Uh, because the calculation should be not be visible to, to the business partners. It's enough for them that I calculate something and they have to trust me. Uh, but then my code uh, I use for the calculation is not exposed uh, and cannot be tampered with. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the important point. There is no perfect system. It's the same thing with contracts. Uh, I have seen a lot of contracts also written um, or in my past with my yeah, if you buy a company, you have is super long contracts. All people assure something, but these contracts are built by twenty lawyers, and they, they sometimes contain stupid errors uh, which nobody found. Yeah, because there was a fifteenth iteration of negotiating the contract. So even if you have contracts in natural language, uh, people do bugs. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's it's the larger it gets, it more difficult it gets to understand by one human being. Um, Okay, does this answer or give you some indication? Yeah, I um, think that was really okay. good. Okay, I think we're um, done for today. Time is up. Fine. So then we will continue next week uh, with uh, the, uh, the three run programming. Uh, and I think, Uli, you have the exercise. Or? Yeah, uh, so I'm doing yeah. the exercise tomorrow. Tomorrow we will um, cover the exercise sheet from last week and introduce the new exercise sheet and uh, talk a little bit about the details here. Okay, welcome back to our lecture today, uh, blockchain-based systems engineering. Uh, we have a little bit of change. You see, I have a different background. I'm back in my office. Uh, the light is different. Uh, we also, you might hear it, have a slightly worse sound and picture quality. Uh, this is due to the fact that Uli also uh, returned from home to his office. And you know his picture, so he has this very impressive setup at his home place. Uh, but unfortunately, the uh, uh, inter internet is down at his home, so he had to come also to the university. And this means that the setup today will be slightly worse than um, in the past. But we still have this backward channel that you can uh, ask questions and Uli then can talk to me. Okay, fine. We ended last week talking about solidity, uh, and we did a very classical language introduction for people like you, which have a master's degree in computer science and which know how to understand languages. So therefore, we went through the more uh, general standard language features, which I think are very easy to understand for anybody uh, which know, who knows um, imperative and object-oriented programming languages. Then we talked a little bit about the new uh, concepts, which you might not be that familiar is, let's say, how to use functions in solidity, how to, uh, what modifiers exist in Solidity uh, since it's a, a persistent programming language and a programming language which is out there on the web where access control plays a very important role. We talked then about the intricacies of multiple inheritance, um, the diamond import problem and how this is being solved. Um, this also happens in other programming languages. And in general, I think the takeaway is inheritance is something uh, this idea of reuse of code uh, and sharing code between different parties is maybe not uh, yet fully understood whether this is a good idea or a bad idea uh, in uh, blockchain-based systems. Uh, because there's always this problem that maybe in the inheritance unexpected things happen uh, for existing code uh, by having a new uh, order where you look up the functions. So therefore, I think that was the main takeaway of the inheritance chapter. And then we also talked about abstract contracts and interfaces, which are very, 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 very relevant, because as we will see later on all these ERC standards for token definition, uh, they rely heavily on the idea that you have, that you have a well-defined programming language, both with access control, but also with type system uh, and uh, a strong compilation so that you can define interfaces, let's say, if you have, let's say, a token definition, or a voting program that people can know exactly how to use this voting program. Um, 
uh, and you have a type checker which makes sure that uh, all clients use uh, the voting program in a correct way. Uh, this has to be seen in a difference with REST-based systems because if you have a REST-based system, the advantage is the REST endpoint can be implemented in any programming language. Um, but uh, if you then send compose REST messages, the structure of the REST messages and the content of the REST messages um, is not well defined. And also the idea how to do identity management in the World Wide Web uh, is also not standardized. So therefore, this is a big advantage what we have here that we can define interfaces with the type system. And we don't have to have interface definition languages like in Corba, Corda, Corba in the past, uh, or REST-based Swagger interfaces, which then have to be compiled into JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, so it's a huge advantage to have these interfaces. Okay, so then we will talk today about first how to design smart contracts. Yeah, if you have a problem, does it fit to the blockchain-based systems engineering? And how do you model more or less your core entities? Uh, let's say, what are their data structures you want to share? And how do you model transactions? Uh, that is uh, the basic, yeah. So and we give one example for blood donations uh, so that you get an idea how this looks in a concrete example and not in a whole world example. Uh, we then move on also today that we talk about cross-contract and blockchain interaction. So the idea is you have now one contract, you deploy it, and now other people have uh, uh, want to interact with your contract. Yeah. So we have other contracts, not only end users, end user owned uh, wallets, uh, which want to interact with your contract, but other contracts. Yeah. What has to be, to be done there? How is this done? Um, and there we, therefore we talk about the address class, which is something like an object pointer uh, in an object oriented language. Uh, and the message object, how you send messages to other contracts um, and block objects uh, and transaction objects, which allow you more or less to then uh, work in such a distributed scenario where multiple contracts interact. Okay, so I think uh, the typical uh, uh, thing you want to talk is um, that you have a problem, yeah, and then you typically get decision trees. Yeah, let's say, do you have a lot of data? Do you have trust, etc.? There are a lot of decision trees which you find in the internet. I think we also showed you some at the beginning of the semester. Uh, and then this is the, the best joke. Uh, so in 99% of the case, do you need a blockchain? The answer is no. Yeah, so that's what, that's what people sometimes say. Uh, so there is a joke model. But otherwise, <coughs> um, you look at the problem domain. <coughs> Uh, and in particular, not only are technical issues, the data model and the algorithmic properties of your contracts, but you talk about <clears throat> trust um, and about existing alternatives uh, to establishing trust. Yeah? So therefore, um, th uh, this is essentially the point where a lot of people are active now finding use cases for blockchain-based systems. And essentially, uh, I think these are the key takeaways. Multiple parties should be involved and these parties should uh, typically do not trust each other and have different interests or diver, uh, contrary interests. Um, they need shared write access to information. It's not only sharing read access, yeah, that you want to publish something and you have millions of reading parties like Twitter, Facebook, <clears throat> or some Deutsche Börse results which are, have to be spread out. It's more or less changing the state of the world. Uh, and it also should be the case that all updates to the database and the history, who did it and why was it done, should be publicly verifiable. Uh, or publicly means for the world, you could also say it should be verifiable amongst the parties which just distrust each other or a subset of them to create trust. Yeah? And that's more or less uh, the important point. Yeah? We have to find such a problem. And even if you have this problem, maybe there are reasons, let's say, blockchains are too slow, they are too uh, expensive, they have consumed too much energy. Uh, maybe you don't have programmers which want to learn uh, uh, solidity, so therefore there might be also alternative solutions which are, give, uh, are uh, favorable compared to blockchain-based solutions. Okay, so typically if you then do seminars, uh, if you go to, uh, let's say, Hyperledger or to, to Corda uh, or, or Ethereum schools, uh, it's essentially the typical thing you do if you build uh, classical software systems. Yeah? Uh, so the first step is for less to model the business process. Yeah, who does what when? Yeah, so what's the process? What are the party parties? What are the involved parties? Their systems and their relationship amongst each other. Are they supplier? Are they competitors? Are they um, consumers, etc.? 
so then you want to look at the necessary interactions. Yeah, if you have a bidding system, okay, what, what, what happens in addition to having bids? Yeah, you set up uh, 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 an auction, uh, who can do this? So what are the necessary interactions between the parties and their systems? Uh, maybe the auction system has to talk to an SAP system. So these would be typical interactions where you more or less from the outside in define the boundaries of your system. Then you want to say what information flows exist and not only control flows, who initiates what, uh, but let's say wh where does the bit information flow to as information flows. Uh, and then you talk about the system boundaries. Yeah, what is done in SAP? what's done in TUM Online, uh, what is done in the matching system. And similarly, you would say, uh, if you have a bidding system or a lottery system, what part of the lottery is done on-chain? And maybe payments and credits and other things may be happening on other platforms, yeah, like a web, a web platform, uh, etc. And there you often uh, should use diagrams to get a big picture yeah, that you really uh, these are context diagrams in classical software engineering where we focus on the systems and the active parts of the active parts of your system, the actors and uh, the active systems, uh, let's say uh, machines which trigger something. Um, that's I think very important that you identify the parties more or less uh, in the systems and uh, also address spaces. So what are clients, what are servers, where are, where are the locations, where are things stored? So then you go from these sketchy things to modeling uh, that you derive concrete models from the identified parties and systems. Yeah, data models, attributes, role models. Uh, you define concrete messages which are exchanged between the systems and the parties. Uh, define concrete data model used in different parts of the system. If you have distributed system, you have multiple data models. Let's say what's stored on the client, what's stored on the server, what's stored on the blockchain. Uh, these would be the modeling things. Uh, then you have interactions uh, between the parties and the systems. Uh, they are very important, these interfaces, yeah, because they decouple your system. And even if you want to change later on the implementation, which is sometimes even diff difficult for production-based systems, uh, you want to have stable interfaces. Yeah? So we will talk about this later. Uh, and therefore, again, you would use classical architecture diagrams from UML, deployment diagrams, and uh, logical uh, distributed system diagrams. Um, and the data model and um, the classes are then uh, also very nicely described with class diagrams. So if you look now at one example, we took this fictitious example of block donation, blood donations. Blood donations. Um, and again, we are still working on this uh, to, after Corona, there is this problem still existing. So the idea is that we have the uh, central uh, Deutsche Rote Kreuz, uh, the Red Cross in Germany, which wants to digitize uh, the blood donation process and make it more transparent. So uh, we want to know where are the blood donations in Germany, where do they come from and where do they go? In particular, if there's a shortage on, of blood donations in one clinic, we want to allow other clinics to access the blood donations of another clinic, which is currently not possible. So therefore, the uh, Deutsche German Red Cross analyzes different technology solutions and they want to now track as a first step the supply blood chain the blood supply chain from blood extraction to the transfusion. Yeah, that's a, that's the bad side test, and that's more or less where you donate your blood. Uh, and the overall process is defined before uh, below. Uh, so therefore, we would look at the as we defined it here. We would say um, uh, what are the processes or the use cases? Yeah, a person goes to the donates blood. Blood is analyzed in the laboratory and labeled. The blood product is sent to the hospital. The hospital checks if a patient's blood is compatible with the product, which is called the cross compatibility check. And then once this check is okay and you find something in the lab, you take the blood and the blood is being transfused. So it's a very simplified process here. So obviously you have now different parties involved, yeah, legal entities, uh, the Deutsche Rote Kreuz, the lab, one or multiple labs, the donor, the hospital, the patient. Uh, and some of these uh, are people, uh, like patient and donor, and some, are, some, are, some others are organizations, uh, like the hospital and the lab and the German Red Cross. Uh, what's also typical is that um, many of these uh, entities already have uh, involved systems. 
in our case, the patient doesn't have an app, yeah, so we don't model patients with an app. So, but we say we look essentially at the uh, inventory uh, laboratory management systems in the laboratory, which more does, does this cross check. Yeah, this is not done manually, this is done by the lab management system and the hospital information system, uh, which knows when patients are created, when patients leave, uh, and uh, they keep track of the blood uh, status of the patients. Yeah, so this is what you have to do. You start outside in. Yeah, in the core, there will be a blockchain, but in order to design the blockchain, you have to understand now the processes, the parties, the technical systems, uh, which is classical IT, uh, and then the interactions. Yeah. And these interactions are then the points where uh, uh, you then have to say what has to happen on chain uh, and what has to happen off chain. Yeah, what has to happen at the Deutsche Roto Kreuz? They have a SAP system, uh, but in addition to what happens already here, uh, something should happen, should happen on the blockchain. Uh, and that's, I think, the crucial point. Yeah, to say, okay, where is the problem? Where is distrust? Yeah, uh, because many things are only relevant to, to the Deutsche Rote Kreuz, the prices and uh, let's say the schedule when people donate blood. But if you want to track the blood, it's all about uh, some a very small set of entities and relationships we are interested in. So if we now look at this example, we first want to find out whether a blockchain makes sense. Yeah, yeah obviously there are multi-parties involved. The parties do not trust each other or have different interests. Um, yeah, one would hope everybody has the same uh, interest, uh, but it could be the case that if anything, something goes wrong and a patient dies because he got the wrong, um, the wrong uh, blood sample, uh, everybody would do finger pointing. Yeah? The Deutsche Rote Kreuz would say, no, no problem. Uh, we said everything okay. We did our checks. It was the nurse which did it wrong. The nurse and the, the clinic would say, no, it was uh, uh, the Deutsche Rote Kreuz. And then maybe they say this clinic. Yeah. So obviously, uh, if everything goes well, they are uh, in the same boat yeah, because they earn money with it. But if uh, something goes wrong and then it goes really very badly wrong, uh, if a patient dies, um, then you have a problem here. Uh, also, uh, not only one party is doing the bookkeeping, yeah, because if one party would do all the bookkeeping, it would be only one party, but we have shared right access. Yeah? So therefore, the Deutsche Rote Kreuz has modifies information regarding to a blood sample, yeah, the quality, the date it has been, um, it has. The labs need to attach information to this blood sample and say this is now blood which is compatible with this patient, uh, or it has this blood, uh, so it, they do analyze a lot of information, not only the uh, blood group and the resus factor, but they also have additional molecular information about the blood sample, uh, which is done by the lab. Uh, and the hospital also needs to read and write because they have to consume uh, and, and also destroy and, and, and uh, move uh, these samples in the house around. Uh, I think also here in this case, it makes sense to say in the end, if anything goes wrong, we want to have somebody like an auditor who wants to look at this information. Um, or not only when, if it goes wrong, but on a regular basis to see whether there are some uh, blood samples which come not from the Deutsche Rote Kreuz, but let's say which are imported from foreign countries, yeah, that should be avoided. So therefore, I think all parties would agree that um, uh, uh, a subset of people has access to these uh, blood samples. I mean, you don't want to have information about the patients, but you want to share information about the blood donation. Okay, so therefore, I think we have uh, a lot of red, uh, not red crosses, green check marks. Uh, which say that this is uh, fine or might be a use case. And now you are asked to build this. And so therefore, uh, we would now uh, distinguish two kinds of entities. Yeah? We have these externally owned accounts, EOAs, um, which more or less are representing the external actors and contracts, which more or less uh, are these autonomous or potentially autonomous contracts, which execute uh, uh, the tracking. Um, so, as you know, transactions are always initiated by externally owned um, accounts and then, uh, therefore, they are then to be controlled by one individual or one party. If you have, have multi-signature uh, arrangements, then the contracts would make sure that they all agree. If an entity needs to be interactive and provide some on-chain functionality, it's a candidate for a contract. Yeah? So, therefore, these active entities like 
uh, lab management systems, etc. are uh, so, so. And if you analyze it, we more or less have information from donors, uh, the, uh, the German Red Cross, the laboratories, the hospital, the patient, uh, and they um, might want to have uh, wallet IDs. Uh, if, if you then decide uh, maybe it's, it's too difficult that each patient gets a wallet ID and each donor gets a wallet ID, then you, you would move the identification of the users off-chain. Yeah? And this is typically happening nowadays that in many use cases, if you want to talk about certificates, about students, uh, about their exams, you wouldn't want the stu each student to have a wallet and to do this. But instead of this, you always uh, um, denominate one party, which more or less does the identity management for the donors, for example. In our case, this would be the German Red Cross, which more or less identifies the donors with their um, uh, passport or their uh, ID, yeah, their, their uh, Personalausweis, um, uh, and then they also do additional checks about the identity of this person. Uh, similarly, the hospital is responsible for keeping track of their patients. So again, the hospital would do these identity claims uh, on behalf of the patient. Yeah, that they would say this was this patient number 512 who died now or who got this, this, um, this information. Okay, um, so therefore we want to now look at the uh, donations, um, uh, which are the core objects, and they will be our contracts. Uh, so it all revolves about uh, keeping track of um, the status of blood, blood donations. Uh, let's say maybe a move to the code here. So therefore the idea is now very simple and this is not re the real thing what we uh, would you do in practice, it's a stripped down version. So the idea is there's one blood donation contract which now has uh, certain uh, transactions, for example, sent to laboratory, sent to hospital, transfuse, um, uh, and you have a constructor where you create a new blood donation. So therefore this blood donation contract is an object which represents one blood donation. Yeah? So it's something like uh, a, a digital twin of a blood donation. Yeah? So therefore, uh, in order to create a blood donation, uh, you would uh, well, record who created it. Yeah? In this case, it's the Deutsche Rote Kreuz. Uh, uh, who is the donor who gave it, uh, which would be an address here. And again, in our case, we do it with a wallet ID, which would be unrealistic in reality. But for the sake of simplicity, we do it. So therefore, you now create a blood donation, which knows, which records that it has been created by, at a certain institute, uh, and that blood is coming from a certain donor. Uh, and uh, in our case, we now would say these donor, Deutsche Rote Kreuz, are externally owned addresses. Uh, so therefore, you can store them here in the contract. Um, and then now, after the blood donation has been created, we want to send it, or the Deutsche Rote Kreuz want to send it to a laboratory. Uh, and so therefore they decide to which laboratory it should be sent. It would be again the address of the laboratory. And so therefore you locally now update the location where the laboratory uh, was selected. Yeah. And then the laboratory can send it, um, or somebody else can send it to the hospital. In our case, only the laboratory should be allowed to do this, and only the Deutsche Rote Kreuz should be allowed to send it to the laboratory. So we restricted this here with these modifiers. Uh, we can send uh, the blood sample to the hospital, and then we would record that it comes from the DRK, it was at the laboratory, now it's at the hospital. Yeah, so that would be the next step. Uh, and here we have the step transfuse, and in the transfuse, uh, we would have a precondition that it can transfuse, um, and then uh, if it can transfuse, which we would uh, assign the patient to the blood donation uh, and take the patient ID here. Uh, and we also would record that it has been transfused uh, and we want to make sure that it is not transfused two times. So therefore we have this condition can transfuse and uh, can transfuse would uh, check um, that it has not already been transfused. Uh, and also that the sender, uh, that the transfusion takes place in the hospital where the patient actually is. Yeah, so this is a very simple uh, constraint, uh, and then we have the other constraint, only the laboratory can do it, which is a precondition, only the sender has to be the laboratory, and only DRK means that the message sender is the Deutsche Rote Kreuz. Uh, so these are the business constraints. 
You could have a lot of other constraints that you say uh, it has to be before it has to be transformed, transfused. It has to be to, it has to be have uh, it has to be uh, gone to the laboratory, uh, and um, as, or here that it has been done in the hospital. So therefore, this is not a full model, more or less. It should be, you give the idea uh, that what you do, you build, build a digital twin. The digital twin has all these attributes which keep track of the history and the current situation of this uh, donation. Uh, uh, it also keeps uh, a state automaton, more or less, and the state automaton, more or less, uh, says in which position of the life cycle is it. Yeah, is it created, is it uh, used or transfused, or has it been destroyed, uh, which is not the case in this case. Huh. Um, so therefore, we would now, uh, if you now know this is the contract, we would have more or less the uh, transaction and messages that we have um, the contract creation. Uh, somebody has to deploy the contract, and that would be uh, the Deutsche Rote Kreuz is responsible for creating uh, this digital twin. The Deutsche Rote Kreuz sends it, sends it to the laboratory. The laboratory sends it to the hospital, and the hospital does the transfusion. That's the happy path, and we want to make sure that the happy path is more or less satisfied. Um, so in order to do this, we first have to have these wallet IDs. Yeah? And with these wallet IDs, we then can run um, the contract in um, uh, on the blockchain. Yeah? So therefore, we had have these uh, wallet IDs or addresses. And then we would have, for each of these blood donations, if we have 100 blood donations, we would have 100 instances of this contract with their individual state. OK. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, so as I said, um, um, ah, so, so, uh, so <laughs> uh, Uli now forwarded what your uh, question. So there was one question regarding the uh, ID of the patients. Yeah, and as I said, so I did two things. The code I show you makes the assumption that uh, the donor, which is the patient, which, or the, not the patient, it's the donor which gives the blood. Uh, they are also sometimes called patient. Uh, but also uh, the, the donor is a person, and the assumption is the donor has a wallet ID, yeah, which is more or less given here because you get a, uh, the address of uh, externally owned wallet of a donor. Uh, similarly, we have the transfusion, which more or less gets the address of a patient. So again, if we model it like this, we would assume that a patient has a wallet. Uh, okay, so therefore this would be the assumption if if we would have a perfect world where all patients and all donors and all people in the world have a wallet ID, which would uh, one or multiple wallets, and they could use these wallets more or less to interact with the blockchain. Uh, since this is not yet the case, uh, we are still working on it. Um, this typical situation is that uh, you don't, in reality, uh, you wouldn't have a patient wallet. You wouldn't have a donor wallet. Instead of this is what I explained, is that the, you would have an identity management done by the hospital for their patients. So therefore, the hospital would issue patient IDs and the donors would be managed by the Deutsche Rote Kreuz. Yeah? So to summarize, uh, a typical blockchain which would be created in reality would be um, a consortium chain between uh, the, the businesses, the hospitals, the laboratories, and the clinics. Uh, and the people would be left out. Yeah? So therefore, this trust relationship between the clinic and Deutsche Rote Kreuz and the donors in Deutsche Rote Kreuz would not be uh, improved, but the trust relationship between the clinics, the laboratories, and the um, blood donation centers would be increased. Does this answer your question? Mm -hmm. So the question was, as far as I said, maybe I could correct me. Uh, 
So here on this, we mentioned a database. Uh, where's the database? Ah, here. So the assumption database here is something, so um, the database is something like a store of information. Yeah, It could be an Excel spreadsheet, uh, or it could be a file system. And so if you now model a system, you don't care whether it's a database or a blockchain or an Excel spreadsheet, or it's a pile of paper where some gnomes read and write to the paper. Yeah, you know what I mean? So therefore the idea is now, if the, you look at the use case, you would say, okay, there's a data store, uh, and this data store is not only uh, read by people. Uh, it's not only one writer and multiple readers, but it's a lot of writers which modify the state of this Excel spreadsheet or the state of this um, paper-based uh, management process. Yeah. So therefore here, rise to the database means that uh, it's like if you go to the notary, it's not only the case that only the notary writes and everybody reads, but multiple people should be allowed to write the data. Yeah? Uh, and even if it's just a pile of paper, uh, multiple people have access, write access to this pile of paper. Okay? Okay. Okay. But I think now it's a little bit more clearer that we would say, okay, um, we now try to boil down uh, this problem to the key piece of information and in which is one blood donation. Now, that's one way of modeling the whole thing. You could also think about modeling different things. Uh, maybe you could model uh, a depot, yeah, something like a store where you say, where is the blood donation stored? Uh, so therefore you have different modeling opportunities how to do it. Uh, but very often it's the case how you would do object oriented design that these objects which are relevant in reality, in this case, the blood donations become uh, objects in your system. Yeah? And the methods of these objects are more or less the interactions of the environment with these objects, which change the state of these objects. Yeah? So that's, I think, a very typical way of modeling things. Um, and I think this is very different what you would typically do if you have a distributed scenario, because typically nowadays, uh, you don't have a representation of blood donation. Yeah? If you want to find out something about that blood donation, you have to go to the clinic and they then look in their tables. When they send something out, uh, the lab would look in, uh, the lab management system would show there come some samples, they come and go. And if you go to the hospital and you say in the, uh, in the transfusion medicine department, uh, there were some blood donations. Yeah? So therefore the reality, how these things tie together end to end, is lost. And that's the benefit of uh, blockchain-based systems, that you can model more or less something like uh, products uh, in the supply chain, one-to-one uh, -one with state machines and have very detailed, uh, persistent information, which can be modified by many parties. And obviously, if you now blood donations, you could have now insurances. You could have insurance contracts which refer to blood donations, that if anything goes wrong, this insurance could automatically trigger something. And that's a typical pattern we will see later on, that also if we, we have another company where I'm involved in, it's about trade financing, and then you want to model a trade. Yeah? Let's say who buy, wants to buy something, what's the trade? And once you have the trade, you can do trade tracking, um, you can track where the trade is, you can do trade financing, you can do trade insurance, uh, because all these other contracts can refer to this uh, truth, which is captured by this um, um, uh, Digital, represent, digital representation of your blood donation or trade. Okay, I think that was more or less the, yeah, that you more or less have this idea what, what we talked about. Now, how does this get met down to real code? Uh, as you have seen, uh, what we also made heavy use here already is this cross contract and blockchain interaction. Yeah, right now it was uh, interaction of uh, the parties with this, these multiple blood donations. But you can imagine a more complicated solution where one blood donation now wants to interact with some insurance or some insurance wants to look, talk to another insurance object. Yeah, so therefore you want to now have interaction between different contracts. Yeah, and that's what we now talk about is cost, cost contract and blockchain interaction. Yeah, so the idea is there's one company doing uh, blood donation tracking and then another company wants to use the blood donation tracking to create additional services, let's say analytics services or insurance services uh, or uh, maybe some 
future business, yeah, that you say, I, I invest in future donations, the price of future donations. Yeah, um, so that these would be things where multiple contracts want to interact with each other. Um, so if you now, <clears throat> if you want to understand this, uh, we uh, can recall this picture, uh, which describes more or less the status of the Ethereum virtual machine. So we have the Ethereum virtual machine, and uh, we down, now look more or less at, at the time axis, more or less. So currently we are here, and we want to execute a transaction. Yeah, so that's more or less the idea. Uh, so therefore the EVM now uh, is invoked by saying we want to execute a certain contract. Uh, and in order to execute a contract, we have to have an address of this contract. And this address of this contract is nothing else but a block, more or less, in the past history. Yeah? Because in a previous block, somewhere, this contract has been created, and uh, the creator of this block got uh, a handle back to this contract. Yeah? So therefore, if I want to execute a function f on a contract c, I need to have the address of this contract. I also have to know the name of the function I want to call, uh, uh, and that would be passed in as this param second parameter to the execute function. Yeah, please execute this function or call this method of this contract, yeah, call this method on this object. Yeah, that would be the same thing you know from object-oriented languages. And in order to call the function, we either have uh, a function without any parameters, which would be not so nice, uh, but typically a function has multiple arguments. Yeah, and these arg uh, actual arguments are then passed in as additional parameters for the execute function. For example, if the function f has two parameters, uh, we would have to pass uh, two additional parameters to the EVM. Okay, so that would be now my uh, initial uh, uh, transaction. So the transaction consists of this green block. Uh, it contains uh, the information of the contract, the function, and the parameters. And this contract, uh, this transaction is passed on to the EVM. The EVM also has an additional input, the status of the current uh, blockchain. Uh, that's the last mined block. And it also gets information from me, namely um, the uh, gas limit, uh, which is more or less the limit I gave to this execution. Uh, it has a timestamp uh, of the current block that needs to be mined. Uh, and it has a difficulty for this block and it has the Coinbase transaction, which is part of this block. Yeah, so therefore the EVM gets from me as a user this information, and from the infrastructure it gets this information, yeah, that it's currently, it's more or less a store, more or less a persistent store, and more or less the uh, current block that is to be mined. Yeah? And based on these arguments, uh, we now have a deterministic virtual machine, which in a very traceable and reproducible manner now, based on this information and the, his, the past recorded history, can execute the code, which produces a right set. Uh, a lot of changes to the system. Yeah, let's say the owner of a uh, wallet is changed. The uh, not the owner, the uh, the status of a uh, of a variable in a contract changes. Uh, so a lot of changes happen now in a transaction. Yeah, not only one value is changed, but two values or more are changed, which is the key property of a transaction. Uh, once we have these changes, we have this change set, and this change set is then used to uh, produce uh, a, new trans uh, a new block, uh, which more or less records the result of this uh, successful execution. Yeah, so all these change changes uh, and the transaction are recorded, or, or no, the transaction now consists, oh, sorry, the, trans the effect of the transaction consists out of these uh, state changes and the information who did it. Yeah? So who executed this transaction, um, with which difficulty has it been uh, mined, uh, what was the gas limit when it was started, and at which time has it been executed. Yeah? And so therefore this now creates a new uh, uh, block uh, and uh, then this whole game uh, uh, repeats that a new function, somebody else executes now a contract, another contract with other parameters, a new thing, and that's more or less the, the standard way how the EVM works. Okay, uh, if you now, so therefore, uh, to, to summarize, the, the code here now has access to this transaction, it has access to the history and to these variables. Um, what we also talked about, that if you now have an externally owned account which created this transaction, as you've seen it, it calls a contract, 
uh, for example, here the contract F, yeah, that was what, what we have seen. But now F might decide that the implementation of F might decide that it's good to call another object, another contract B, which is already on the blockchain. So therefore now the contract A calls itself while it's executing transaction um, F. It uh, now does a message call to B. Uh, B itself has an implementation of a function G, so it calls the function G of B. Uh, and the implementation of the function uh, G of B consists in a call of an object of the functions H of object C. Uh, so therefore we have now a call of uh, function H of C, which goes to another contract. Yeah. Uh, um, what is important now that while the execution is going uh, ongoing, uh, the gas is reduced. Yeah. So therefore here we get initial am amount of gas. And each other contract now has a re re reduced gas, or he can also artificially reduce the gas, uh, which is available to the execution of contract B. Contract B can use this gas or limit this gas and provide, uh, provide it further to contract C. So that's the model, the flow of control and the flow of gas between these contracts. Um, so therefore, if you now look at an arbitrary contract here, uh, we now get a lot of information from uh, the externally owned account, uh, the initial transaction call, and the message header and the guest provided to my contract. Yeah? And that's more or less the, the, the situa general situation if you write a contract that your contract can either be externally called, called or it can be called by other contracts. And depending on this, uh, you then have different information about the caller and the call chain. Um, okay, and yeah. And in order for contracts to refer to each other, they use addresses. Yeah? So therefore, you have the address of the externally owned account, you have the address of the contract A, you have the address of contract B, and the address of contract C. So therefore, we want to now work with addresses. Yeah? What are the functions which are available to addresses, which we didn't discuss so much. So it's very sim similar to the uh, class um, object, which you have an object or languages, because it's, it's essentially a pointer to an arbitrary contract or an arbitrary wallet. Um, uh, and, and this is then called an address. Um, and here, for example, we have an address, and you can literally write down addresses. Yeah. For example, uh, if you want to refer to a certain contract you found somewhere on the internet, you simply take the address of this contract, and you can write it as a constant in your code. Yeah? You can write this uh, string as a hexadecimal number, and then use this uh, hope that this. <laughs> A string represents a valid contract on the blockchain. Yeah, so therefore, you can now define uh, variable A of type address, and you initialize it with this literal, which is a 20-byte hex code. Uh, that's one way yeah, that you can more or less use well-known addresses of well-known contracts uh, to write them into your code. Uh, it could also be the address of a well-known entity, the Deutsche Rote Kreuz. Maybe they have published their address, and you want to make sure that uh, a contract, uh, a call, comes from a certain wallet, which is owned by this address. Yeah, so therefore, there's good reasons to use these literals. Uh, what you also can do is uh, you can uh, cast any contract object into an address. Yeah, so therefore, if you have now contract A, which has a function, and we now have another contract, which wants to refer to this contract A, we could create a new uh, contract instance. Yeah? So therefore, the function G creates a new instance of uh, the contract A and names it uh, small a. And again, a is of type address. Yeah? Oh, no, so sorry. A is, in this case, of type A, yeah? because we know it's an A contract. And now we can cast it in a safe way to an object or to an uh, address. So therefore, we now take the address of A. Yeah? So this is A, which is an A object. And we say we don't care there's an A object, we want to turn it in a plain address with, all the, with no further information about the type of this object. And that would be then a, a contract A address, which is of type address. Um, uh, and another way to get addresses is that I use the keyword this, so that I would say, okay, uh, inside my contract execution, uh, the object, uh, the keyword this refers to the current uh, receiver of this message. So therefore, with this, uh, I also get an object which is of type contract B, and I could then uh, cast this contract object of type B to um, an address, uh, and I call this address self. 
Uh, so these are the ways you can more or less uh, get addresses of well-known objects or addresses of yourself or addresses of other contracts, instances. Okay, uh, what can I do now with addresses? Um, so the, uh, um, so uh, one way is that you have an address, um, if they, like in an object, you like a pointer to an arbitrary object, and now you want to try a type check. You yeah, want to say, uh, so is this really a valid address of uh, an A object? Yeah. So therefore, we want to make sure that if this is an address, uh, we cannot only use it as an address and pass it around as an argument and store in your data structures, but we want to make sure that this object is really of type A. Yeah. So therefore, we would do it casting to A. Uh, and this only works if the contract identified by the address is an instance of A, uh, or um, it could be a, a subclass of uh, A. Yeah? So you could have something uh, that you have subclasses uh, because objects of a subclass can also be seen as objects of a superclass. So let's look at an example. So in our case, what we do here, now we create a new A object. Um, and uh, we, oh, no, that's the code we have seen before. So we take the same code like on the previous page. Uh, and now uh, we now moved so we've lost type information. These are addresses. Contract A is an address, and self is an address. And if we would now uncomment these lines, uh, we could now um, do um, a, a downcasting of B, or we could take self and downcast it to B. Uh, and this would not crash at runtime. Yeah, we could then safely use again B as a B object. Uh, we could also try to a contract A and cast it to B, which would fail because contract A is not a subclass of contract B. Uh, so therefore, this would create a runtime error if we want to use do this downcast to B. Okay, again, as in object-oriented programming language, you can do it also with persistent objects on the blockchain. Um, what are now, uh, let's say, built-in uh, operations on uh, addresses? And you know this in object-oriented languages, you always have things like equality tests or a cloning of objects, which you can do. Uh, and here are the built-in operations on arbitrary objects. Uh, one is the balance uh, uh, field or balance selector. Given an address, which could be an externally earned address or a normal contract address, you can ask for the balance. Yeah, and this is returned in way which is um, well, the smallest unit of ether uh, as an unsigned integer was 256 bit long. Uh, that's more or less the balance of this uh, contract or wallet. Then you have money transfer operations. Uh, and the idea is, um, um, so the, the operation is to transfer uh, a value. So, if you execute the transfer operation on an address, uh, you have to pass it a 256-bit uh, uh, unsigned value, which is the money you want to transfer to this account. Yeah? So this model is a transfer from your own wallet to the um, to the um, uh, to the target address. Uh, why there? Okay, and additionally. Um, so you, you forward gas to the target address. Yeah, so that's more or less the, uh, uh, um, nah, a, a, a additional side effect of this operation. Uh, what you also want to do is, um, and this fails if it doesn't work. Yeah, if you don't have enough money uh, or the, if the receiver doesn't accept it, then this would uh, return uh, an exception. Uh, if you want to set, do a send operation, and you want to control the, whether it happens or not, and you don't want that the whole contract uh, crashes, you would perform the operation send. Uh, you perform the uh, transfer, but you can uh, get back a Boolean value. Uh, so these would be money transfer operations here. Um, and we will talk about the things you have to consider if you do this later on. Um, the second thing is what you could do is that you want to... Um, um, that you want to call an arbitrary function on a certain address. Yeah, so um, that's a small as a rather, how would you call it? It's something like reflection, yeah, that you more or less want to call a certain function on a given object. Uh, 
uh, without knowing its type. Uh, that you say, I assume that this object has a certain method and I want to call this certain method, uh, but that's more or less a very a dangerous thing. Uh, you could also use it for, for uh, transfer operations. So therefore, this is a very unsafe operation we should avoid. Uh, but it's used in, in situations where you want to create a, a contract, you compile a contract, and you want to start to execute it. Um, then you has, have also another low-level function which is called delegate call, uh, where you could more or less uh, you receive a call, and you don't want to uh, create a subcall which more or less forwards the request to another thing, but you want to delegate the call so that you are you are not in the call chain anymore. Yeah, it's a delegation, uh, again, is something like we often use for proxies, that you have a proxy object, and the proxy object doesn't add any value and doesn't, should, doesn't want to do any more, um, uh, any more uh, operations, and you want to simply take the call you have and forward the whole call to some other object. Yeah. Again, this has limited value. It's very good for generic programming. If you have so wrapper contracts, which more or less take information and delegate it and uh, do some additional bookkeeping, but otherwise, I think you would not use it uh, in your, your normal life. Uh, so again, so this is now these inter-contract inter interactions we, we have here. Uh, mm -hmm, yeah, there's a question. Um, yeah, that's necessary, I think, to, as far as I know, for that the receiver can process this information, but maybe you can correct me. Uh, so Uli says this also, so I would say it's, it's necessary for the computation, and Uli says it also creates a um, uh, event at the receiver side where the ah okay and the, the number the, the the sum comes because it's the amount of gas you need to create an event okay 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 and again, this is fine print more or less. Yes, you, if you want to calculate how much uh, gas you're consuming, you're implicitly uh, transferring gas to the other address. So therefore, this is important if you want to do gas calculation for your code. Okay. Um, and again, this is important yeah, because he, here now, and therefore there are these two chapters. One chapter is you write code and you call your functions. This is ordinary programming. Uh, and so if uh, you consume your own gas and uh, you don't transfer any money. But as soon as you want to work with other contracts, you have to think about, okay, who consumes, you know, who consumes your gas? Yeah, <laughs> more or less, who's working on your gas? Uh, and secondly, what can go wrong at the other side? Yeah? And so therefore, uh, if you interact with other contracts, uh, additional complexity arises. Uh, okay. Uh, other things, the other party, so if you now implement a code which can be called from some other uh, um, contracts, you have access to this message object. And the message object is more or less, if you remember, the message object, uh, if you are here, the message object is the thing you get from the other contract. Yeah? And the message object, if you now look more closely at it, has a sender, yeah? who said uh, the, uh, who called you? Uh, what's more or less the data uh, the person sends to you? That, what are the formal arguments of your method uh, you get? What's the message signature? Yeah, so um, which is more or less the signed data of the sender. And additionally, uh, a value if you want to transfer uh, value more or less. Yeah, so the uh, if you want to transfer ether. Yeah. That's, that's something if, if somebody wants to transfer money. Yeah, and you can look at this in your code. Um, okay, so therefore now we see some piece of code, how to work with this message object. For example, here we have a contract A uh, and it should return an address. Uh, and therefore in this case, it would return the sender of the message. Yeah? So therefore, if I would call it uh, A.F, I would expect to get back my address uh, if I directly call it here, yeah, because I'm the message sender. Uh, 
Um, I could also then um, uh, have an indirect call so, so that uh, I write a function g, which now calls f. Yeah, and then uh, since um, since this is a local function, yeah, since f is called directly, message sender will be the address which calls g. Yeah, so therefore, uh, if now I look at message sender, uh, even if I called it through uh, the function g, the uh, message sender would not be a, but the caller of g. Yeah, that's important. What what is written here? Yeah, so if therefore. Um, so therefore here this um, function f uh, doesn't need to be public because it gets indirectly called, um, but the message sender of f is the person which externally called g in this case. Uh, what else do we have here? We have, uh, for example, here this dot f of, yeah, okay. Now, the, now we have h and now h calls uh, this dot f um, and um, in this case, f is called by the current contract instance, and the uh, a message sender will always be equal to address of this. Uh, and in this case, f has to be public. Okay. Um, and again, these are very specific cases you have to know. Yeah? Like if I now do a language report, uh, uh, and later on in, in reality, uh, most of the code which does these kinds of things is uh, core transfer operations uh, where you more or less want to uh, transfer money and you want to authentication checks and authorization checks. Um, if we go back to this picture, um, we now have seen, if you write code here, uh, how you access uh, the message objects. Uh, now we want to look how do you access the currently block that is being mined. Yeah? So how do you access this public object, yeah? which is more or less, uh, can be influ influence the execution of your code. So we have the block object, and again, you can now access the variable Coinbase, difficulty, guess limit, and timestamp uh, of the current block being mined. Again, it's possible, but it won't be the daily things what you do in, as a typical Solidity programmer. Uh, and finally, we have the transaction object. Uh, this is again the chain. And uh, we talked about how this contract B can access uh, the message object from contract A. Or if contract B calls itself, what would be the message object? Now contract B could also say, please give me the transaction object. And contract B then would uh, get access to this external call, um, externally owned account, uh, the initial transaction, which more or less called. So it's global transaction very similar to the message of employees in virtual transaction that trigger the function call. And so therefore the main difference is that 3x always refers to a transaction, to an externally owned account, um, and therefore one variable which is very important is the tx origin, which is the issuer of the transaction, yeah? the person which uh, initiated the transaction. This is always an externally owned account. And also you can get the gas price, um, so the external transaction also defined a gas price, uh, what is it, it's willing to pay for each, each gas in Ether. Yeah, and also this information is accessible here. Uh, and again, it's very rare that you really want to know this in, in, in effect, but uh, in, in library functions that is useful information that you know, uh, in, that you have access to this information in principle. Okay, are there any questions on these fundamentals, more or less? Uh, and as I said, these are fundamentals for cross-transaction and um, cross-contract and cross-blockchain um, inter interaction. 